The concept for EPAR trade is basically, in my opinion, there's a big hole in the internet. So the internet started many years ago, but there's never been an online business community for racers on the World Wide Web. The need for EPAR trade is actually quite obvious. Basically, people in the business of auto racing need a place online to hang out and get their problems solved. It's extremely simple for a buyer or for a supplier to interact on the platform. The first thing you need to do is sign in, which is free. And the second thing is when you see a product that you're interested in, all you need to do is click on request more information. If it's a company, you click on request more information. And then from there, it is forwarded directly to the buyer or to the supplier. You can go to epartrade.com, you become part of a community of businesses in racing and it makes uh, sourcing products much easier than just on the internet or using Google. At epartrade there is no e-commerce, it's literally a connection just like at a trade show. So now, any time of the year, a buyer could reach out to a supplier through an email. More than that, it's a place to go just to keep current every day. So it's a good place to start your work day in your racing business or in your offices of your professional race team. And you know you're current when it comes to new technology, industry news, technical papers, technical videos, all of that and more. We're not looking for a million hits per day. All we want is people who are really the volume buyers of racing products in the racing industry to be part of the little world of EPAR trade. We have racing businesses participating from around the world. So you get suppliers from around the world, you get buyers from around the world. EPAR Trade really eliminates having to travel, closing down your shop. Now you have a place to showcase globally your racing product and technology. Good morning! I am uh, Francisque Savignan, the founder and CEO of EPAR Trade, the global online platform for the performance and racing industry. Welcome to Race Industry Now, the technical and business webinar series from EPAR Trade, presented to you by uh, ARP. This is episode 125, and we're going to be talking suspension. With me this morning is Judy Keen uh, from North Carolina, where she's uh, traveling this week. And, uh, Judy is the co-founder of ePart Trade, and uh, Brad Gilly, our wonderful host. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good morning. Good morning. Great. Peace. I'm really excited to have Garrett on today. I've known him well over 10 years. And Garrett's one of those guys that just make things happen. He has just built a new building in Brownsburg, expanded, great facility, great video on his website. So check that out. But he also has Pit Boss Jacks, and he's launched a new app for race team management that everybody should check out. So he just makes things happen. Great. Excellent. So um, we are going to be bringing uh, Garrett on and uh, uh, getting a message from our producer right now. So Brad Gilly, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll let you take over as soon as, uh, you know, we get our guest on. And there, there they are. Good morning, guys. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. Good. Excellent. Mr. Gilly, you're in charge. <clears throat> All right. Thank you very much, Francis. Really appreciate that. Very excited about this one this week, for sure, uh, because we spend a lot of time about making race cars go fast. We spend a lot of time talking about performance, and we spend a whole lot of time uh, helping buyers and suppliers connect, and we spend a lot of time talking about uh, great new products as well, and very excited to have from Competition Suspension, uh, both Garrett Andrews, the president, and Shahab Saka, the design engineer, as we talk about twin tube versus mono tubes for short track racing. And gentlemen, um, first of all, once again, welcome. How are you guys doing here on this Wednesday? Doing really good. Uh, thanks for having us and excited to uh, discuss this hot topic in short track racing with you guys and kind of simplify um, some of the differences so the uh, end user can make the most educated decision for their application. 
Well, and this is, of course, a good time to be talking about this because, uh, you know, anyone in racing knows that you make your season in the off season. And for a lot of people, we're not just getting into the off season, but we're also getting into the part of the season where we have a lot of big specialty shows coming up. Um, and, and heck, before you know it, a lot of people are going to be descending on Tulsa for the Chili Bowl and a lot of other things that are coming up, which is going to be a great thing. So this is an exciting topic to be talking about here today. As always, I want to remind you that if you have a question uh, to either of our guests here, please Feel free to type it into the chat and we'll get as many questions through as we can. Uh, but first of all, I just I do want to start about talking about um, what you guys have going on right now at Competition Suspension. As Judy had mentioned, you just moved into a brand new space and um, really love the videos that you guys are putting out, uh, you know, on your Facebook page and the website and everything talking about that. But give us an idea of where you guys are right now with the business and how it's growing. Yeah, um, we're, we started in 2009 and uh, with a focus on short track racing. So uh, my background, I grew up in short track racing, but had been a, a damper engineer in IndyCar for uh, almost a decade and wanted to get back to short track racing. And so since 2009, we've um, really grown in, in our core markets, which would be quarter midgets, micro mini sprints, uh, midget sprint cars. Um, here this summer, we completed construction on our new uh, headquarters here in Brownsburg. And uh, so we got moved in here and currently we're just getting ready for, uh, as you mentioned, a couple big races. Um, it's a big uh, going to North Carolina in a couple weeks for a 10,000 to win micro race at Millbridge. And then the world finals, which kind of caps off the outdoor season. And then we'll start to uh, prepare uh, for indoor Tulsa shootout chili bowl. So we're working really hard on some, uh, new products and, and finalizing uh, on track testing for those products. So we're, we're ready to kick off 2022 to give our customers as big of an advantage as we can. Yeah, it's a really exciting time of year for sure. Well, uh, let, let's just talk about the topic, the title of today's webinar, Twin Tube versus Monotube Shocks for Short Track Racing. So uh, if you would, um, uh, you know, either Garrett or Shahab, give us an overview of exactly what we're going to be talking about here today. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and just start by explaining the basic design differences between the two. Um, to start, the main difference is how the shock accounts for the change in fluid volume when the shaft enters the body. Uh, the fluid that's used in the shock is, for all intents and purposes, incompressible. So if you have a shaft that's going into the body into an incompressible fluid, then this thing wouldn't move at all. So if you bolted this onto your car, it'd be like having a solid strut, uh, not very good for ride comfort or handling. So we need something that's in the shock body that can compress uh, as the shaft enters. And this is what we use nitrogen gas for. Uh, the reason we use nitrogen, it's relatively low cost and uh, pretty inert, not exactly inert, but uh, more inert than just regular air. So we had some uh, diagrams that we've prepared that we'd like to show you now that kind of help explain things. All right, so what are we looking at here with all of this? So on the left, we've got our basically a schematic of our twin tube shock. Um, as the shaft enters the shock body, this fluid is gonna push against what we call a gas bag. Uh, that gas bag contains about three to four PSI of nitrogen gas. So as the shaft comes in, this fluid is gonna push against the gas bag and compress the gas bag. And the reason that's called a twin tube is you have your inner tube, inner sleeve here, and then you've got the outer body that kind of acts as a reservoir for this fluid to move into. Um, as the chef retracts out of the body, this gas bag will expand and fill up that volume. Uh, moving on to like a monotube, instead of having a gas bag, we've got a, another chamber with pressurized nitrogen gas and a floating divider piston. As the chef enters the body, the fluid will push against this divider piston and compress the nitrogen that's in here. So here's the animation of a twin tube. You can kind of see the, the blue section would be represented as a gas bag, uh, compressing and expanding. 
And here's kind of an animation of a monotube. This is your floating divider piston here. And this is the nitrogen pressure that's compressing and expanding as the shaft enters and exits the body. So th this leads to a couple of different uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the first being the monotube usually has a larger piston compared to the twin tube, uh, simply because the twin tube has to fit, twin tube piston has to fit inside this inner sleeve. So if the shock body is the same diameter, without that inner sleeve, you can make your piston diameter larger. Uh, the larger the piston is, the more oil can flow through and the easier it is to control the damping forces. Um, another benefit to a monotube would be that since this piston and fluid are in direct contact with the outer body, uh, they can kind of help dissipate heat a little bit better uh, versus a twin tube here. The piston is sort of insulated from the outer body uh, by this inner sleeve. Let's go back. Um, another sort of advantage of a twin tube actually compared to a monotube, uh, if you're on a dirt track and you have rock or any other debris come and hit the, the outer body, if this were to hit the body here and dent in, as this piston comes by, it's gonna hit that dent and it's gonna have a lot of damage on this piston possibly have a shock failure. If you have a dent on this twin tube, as long as that dent doesn't impact the inner sleeve or pop this gas bag, it should still be able to function. Uh, we feel like there's benefits uh, to both and there's time and place for both. And that's why we offer both to our customers. So when it comes to, uh, you know, you talk about benefits, uh, you know, what are the advantages? Where would I want to use a twin tube versus maybe using a monotube? Where does that come into play? Sure. So a lot of that will really be dictated by, uh, one, the type of race car you have, and then two, the track conditions you're racing on. So uh, certain cars, um, how the shock is mounted, you're really limited in length. Right. And so uh, typically a twin tube shock will have a shorter installed length for the same amount of stroke. Um, so there might be an application where like a, a junior sprint, a uh, smaller kids race car where a twin tube just going to fit better. Um, we're able to get the stroke we need in a smaller package. Uh, so that would be one area where you would make your choice based on uh, application um, and then track conditions. So on a rough racetrack, uh, a monotube shock is going to be superior. Uh, majority of the time. And the main reason for that is you're able to add or remove gas pressure um, because you have uh, your exposed Schrader valve here. So on a rough racetrack, you can add gas pressure to improve uh, control and response of the shock, where on a twin tube shock, um, you know, the, the gas bag is inside of the shock and uh, whatever volume is in it is in it. You can't adjust that. So I was going to ask you about that because in the diagram, you can see the valve um, there on the mono shock and, and just how that comes into play. And you mentioned being on a rough racetrack too. Is there an advantage when we're talking about, you know, different types of damping like rebound and all of these, you know, and, and different things like that is one or does one maybe have an advantage over the other? Um, as far as rebound, not necessarily. Um, I feel like on a typically on a monotube shock, you can get some more rebound in it versus a twin tube. Uh, with a couple, for a couple reasons. One, as Shahab had mentioned, that larger piston, um, you're able to get a little bit more uh, rebound dampening um, through the amount of shims you can get on it. And then also, um, the monotube shock is going to cool a lot better, uh, again, as Shahab mentioned. And when you get to these cars that have a lot of rebound, um, whether it be like a right front of a dirt late model, um, a left rear on a sprint car, they're running a lot of rebound. Well, that rebound generates a lot of heat. And so as we can keep the shock cooler, uh, we'll have a lot less force fade throughout the race. So um, in a high rebound situation, typically a monotube shock would be a preferential for the user. Yeah, if, um, you know, when it comes to that, is there a shock design of choice for dirt track racers? I mean, it sounds like, you know, at least in talking about this, the monotube does have a lot of advantages. But again, you know, we are talking about twin tube versus monotube. Sure. So um, 
in my experience um, and in my opinion, as a shock tuner or a crew chief, um, it really comes down to driver preference. So in order for the driver to, to operate the car at the limit, uh, which is what needs to happen every single lap for a guy to be successful and win a race, he has to be comfortable. So that's paramount to anything is what is the driver comfortable with? Um, when you compare monotube and twin tube from a budget or team standpoint, typically your twin tube shock is less expensive um, than a monotube. Um, and that can be, a, you know, a four or five, six hundred dollar savings for a set of shocks um, that, that the twin tube would save. So if you're a budget racer um, and more of an entry level racer, a twin tube shock might be the way you're going to go strictly from a budget standpoint. Um, also, as we work with different uh, age racers, um, your older racers, they grew up on twin tube shocks. So monotube is fairly new technology to the short track scene, probably in the last 15 years or so. And so a lot of those guys grew up on twin tube shocks, which um, twin tube shock typically will move around a little bit more. Um, again, it doesn't have that control um, that a gas shock does or a monotube shock does. And they have just become accustomed to that feel of uh, more of a plush ride, the car moving around more, and that's what they like to feel. And when they put a monotube shock on, which is a little bit more rigid, um, those guys feel like maybe they've lost the feel of the race car. So as we're tuning and working with different customers, um, the older guys, uh, if they, they grew up on twin tubes, a lot of them, it's hard to get to switch. Where the young kids, they don't have a preconceived notion on what the feel should be. They just want to go out there and hammer the gas pedal and drive as hard as they can. And that monotube shock feels just fine to them because the car is um, stable and, and that's just all they know. Yeah, let's talk about some of the uh, technological advancements. And you mentioned, you know, monotubes really coming into uh, short track racing and dirt track racing here in the last 15 years or so. Uh, what are some of the advancements that um, have changed maybe a racer's preference over the past decade or so? Um, one of the big things is the introduction of base valves onto monotubes. Uh, Garrett kind of touched on how the monotube or gas shock can feel a little more stiff. Uh, the reason that is, is that the first kind of gas shocks that were used didn't have base valves. Um, and the reason for having one is that when the piston or the shaft is moving at high velocity, that fluid doesn't necessarily want to flow through the piston. So it's going to push that fluid out of the way and create lower pressure on the backside. And that can lead to cavitation. If that pressure drops below the vapor pressure of the fluid, you'll get little bubbles to form. And then when the shock rebounds, it's going to flow through those little bubbles instead of the fluid and you're going to lose damping. So what the base valve does, is kind of acts as like a restrictor um, and supports that fluid so that you don't have to run such high gas pressure um, in here to support that fluid, the fluid will flow through here and be restricted. And then you won't have such the, that stiff feeling. So that high gas pressure in here is pushing on that fluid, which is also pushing on the piston and the shaft. And that's what gives that stiff feeling. So having a base valve, you can run lower gas pressures without having cavitation and get that sort of plush feel that a lot of drivers are accustomed to. Are, are base valves now being built into all mono shock or monotube shocks now? Uh, that's a great question. Um, not necessarily because the uh, added cost of a base valve, right? It's an additional part. Um, it's basically a secondary piston um, and that also needs shims or uh, check valves. However, you're going to control through that. So that adds, you know, up to $200 uh, per shock um, in cost. So some series have regulated uh, the use of base valves to keep the cost down uh, on the shocks in those series. But I would say 90% uh, of the series that allows base valves, those users are, are using base valves because of that advantage to be able to reduce pressure uh, in the shock and uh, which can increase driver feel and overall grip. Yeah, curious. So let's just say I've used the twin tube, you know, and like you were talking about, you know, most older people, that's what they've used. That's the feel that they're getting used to. And now I'm learning something new. How new is this for me to learn? I mean, is this just about going out on the track and adjusting to the feel? Or are there different things that I might need to be thinking about when I'm adjusting my shocks, when I'm trying to get what I need out of the race car? 
Yeah, so we we experience this on a daily, weekly basis as we're working with customers at uh, either here at the shop or at a race event. And um, as Shahaba touched on, the initial gas shocks that came out didn't have base valves. You had to run a lot of pressure. So the guys that tried them 10, 15 years ago, um, the car felt really good when the track had a lot of grip because they could uh, really get to the gas pedal, um, be aggressive, and, uh, and the car was really stable and it made good grip. However, when the track uh, slicked off on a dirt track or temperatures dropped on an asphalt track and we just lost grip in the racetrack, um, they lost that feel and they lost grip. So a lot of those guys are very standoffish when we recommend a monotube shock for their application. They're like, no, I've tried that. I don't like the feel. Um, however, as shock companies have continued to evolve and develop the base valve, develop better pistons, um, and, and just technology improves over time, um, we've really been able to get a lot of the feel of a twin tube shock in a monotube, um, essentially having very similar internal spring rates. And uh, so we just have to uh, show that to the customer. Um, a lot of times we're going to run a very similar setting monotube to twin tube. Um, it's just a, it's, the car is going to feel a little bit different and they have to uh, adjust to that. And, and sometimes that can be a challenge. Uh, I would say the majority of the time, once we get them to put them on the car and work with us in tune, um, they're very happy with the additional ability to tune for different track conditions and, uh, and are happy with the overall performance. But every now and again, we just do run across a guy that uh, likes the feel of that twin tube um, and, and that's what they're accustomed to. And, and we can't get them convinced that the monotube is um, a more technologically advanced shock, um, a better performing shock over the duration of the race. Um, they just, they prefer the twin tube. And there is guys that still win races on, on twin tube shocks and technology is advancing on twin tube shocks as well. Um, just the <clears throat> biggest limiting factor is, is these gas bags. Um, they've improved over time. You know, 10 years ago, a rough racetrack, it wasn't uncommon at all to pop a gas bag. Um, but materials have improved and they are much more robust than they were um, a decade ago. You know, it's interesting when you describe the track conditions. I mean, you know, that could be a lot of Friday and Saturday nights for a lot of people. Things start to cool off. The track starts to go slick. You know, is this something that I'm chasing throughout the night? You know, if I'm in between heats and features and all of that, or is this something when I work on the baseline setup of my race car for the night, I can just stick with, I just need to understand what kind of feel I'm going to have. Yeah, so most of our customers, if, if they're on a monotube platform, that, that's typically what they run. Um, we do have some customers, especially like on the West Coast, um, where early in the year and late in the year, um, that they, their season's longer than us here in the Midwest just because of weather. And in the spring and the fall, the tracks are really hooked up and rough on the dirt side. Um, a lot of those guys will keep, if they're twin tube customers, they'll keep a gas set for those certain conditions. And uh, they might run twin tubes throughout the summer, but then this time of year when uh, they're getting a lot of rain out there and temperatures are cooling off, tracks are rougher, um, they'll have monotube shocks for those instances. On the asphalt side, it seems like guys are either twin tube or monotube and they don't really have any um, cross um, pollination of sorts. But uh, on the dirt side, we do have some customers that they'll run twin tube shocks in certain applications and monotubes in the other, and they've built their setups around those different platforms. You know, this sort of answers the question, but I want to ask it because it did come from the chat in case there's anything else that uh, that needs to be expanded upon. But it says, uh, do track and or weather conditions play a role in selecting twin or mono? And even going beyond just weather conditions, when you talk about getting into rainy seasons and maybe a more rough racetrack and all of that, hot and cold, any of those different things impacted as well? Yeah, so on the asphalt side, obviously track temperature is going to change the amount of grip in the racetrack. Um, again, I think if you built your setups around monotube shocks, um, that's what you should stick with and you're going to be more inclined to change um, a rebound setting um, or a compression setting in the shock versus changing models. Um, now on the dirt side, uh, we do have customers, as I mentioned, that go from twin tube to monotube. So smooth, slick racetracks. If a customer calls to order a set of shocks and 100% and of our shocks are, are custom built exactly for driver weight, chassis, tracks. Um, and one of the questions we always ask is, where are you racing at? Uh, we're familiar with a lot of the tracks based on uh, traveling across the country, tuning shocks and helping customers. But uh, if we're not familiar, we'll ask them, how is your track? Is it, does it stay smooth and slick? 
Uh, if it does, you can probably get away with a twin tube shock package. You don't need to spend that extra money for mono tube. Um, but if you race at a place that gets rough or builds a big cushion, we always try to steer them towards a monotube shock package because it's going to give them the, a broader range of tuning. Um, and again, with a monotube shock, if your track does go smooth and slick, you have the ability to reduce gas pressure. Uh, all of our monotube shocks are base valve um, outside of dirt modified stuff because, again, the rules don't allow it. Um, so it gives them the ability to uh, tune not just compression and rebound dampening numbers, but also tune um, gas pressure, which controls the internal spring rate in the shock. Oh, that sounds great. You know, while we're talking about this and before we get to some more of the chat questions, some of the other topics that we're going to be covering here, uh, and I do want to encourage folks, if you do have a question, just feel free to type it into the chat and we will absolutely talk about it. But you mentioned, you know, people call in and you can, uh, you know, build shocks and tune shocks and do everything for the driver weight for the type of racing and all of that. Uh, I know we talked about your new shop there in Brownsburg, but, but everything you do happens out of that shop, right? I mean, you guys are building and manufacturing all of these right there in Indiana? Yeah, so we um, we outsource most of our manufacturing. So uh, Shahab does all the design work. We design all of our pieces in-house. Um, a lot of times we'll do uh, prototyping in-house, um, but the actual manufacturing is outsourced to uh, local machine shops. Most everything is made right here in Indiana. Uh, we do use a few shops outside of Indiana, but all in the U.S. And uh, then when the parts come back in, uh, Shahab would do the inspection process, make sure everything is uh, within tolerance and matches our design. And uh, then we do all of the assembly testing um, here and, and custom building for customers in house. That's pretty exciting. All right, another question from the chat for adjustable shocks. Are there differences in what monotube and twin tubes can offer? Uh, no, not really. Um, we have uh, everything from a non adjustable, single, double adjustable uh, in both the twin tube uh, and monotube shocks. Um, we have a, a quad adjustable shock, which is kind of a hybrid of sorts. It is actually a twin tube shock, but rather than a gas bag, we designed it to have um, a divider piston where we can add or remove gas pressure. Um, so that's a new shock, our XT series. Um, and again, it's kind of a hybrid. It's a twin tube shock with adjustable gas pressure. It doesn't use a gas bag. Um, but you, you, most manufacturers do have um, single and double adjustable versions of twin tube and gas shocks. Um, so you, you do have options there. All right, so so this is where I start to get into the full geekdom and maybe even start overthinking things. Um, you know, if we're talking about twin or monotube, is there ever an application or is this just way overthinking it where, you know, maybe I might be looking at something on the front which is different on the back, maybe a mono up here or, uh, you know, a twin tube in the back or anything like that, or is that just um, digging way too deep in a place where you don't need to go? No, that's actually a really good question. Um, for a long time, the majority of our dirt midget packages uh, were twin tubes on the front and the left rear and a mono tube on the right rear. And the main reason for that was uh, the sidewall of a midget tire um, is extremely thin. There's a lot of sidewall deflection and you just had to have a mono tube shock over there to control that. Um, on the fronts, those guys are a coilover spring application, a lot of time running a secondary or helper spring. And uh, all of that spring, uh, your main spring and your secondary spring just fit better on a twin tube shock. Um, so for a long time, that was the design of choice. Uh, three twin tubes with a monotube right rear. Uh, here in the last few years, um, some of the spring manufacturers have started to come out with some shorter spring options. Um, and that gave us the ability to then put uh, both springs on a monotube shock. And now the majority of our uh, dirt midget customers are running monotube on all four corners. Um, but there still is some applications where, uh, again, as I mentioned, different track conditions. Uh, a team on the West Coast, if they maybe couldn't afford a whole secondary set of shocks, they're twin tube users, um, but they know in the, the spring and the fall, they're gonna uh, really account for some rough track conditions. They might just buy a monotube right rear shock which uh, the right rear on, you know, your dirt track cars is doing a lot of the work. Um, so they'll have a monotube shock to put on the right rear if they experience extreme rough track conditions. But uh, yeah, that does happen. 
Hey, give us an idea. You know, if you go to the website, you can look at shock packages, you can look at individual shocks and all of these things. So when I go to the website or when I call in there, you know, what are some things that um, that I need to have on the ready when it comes to questions or at least answers for questions that might be uh, a potential there? But some of the things that I can do, some of the options that I have uh, when it comes to the products. Yeah, so whether you order online or you call in, um, there's a series of questions uh, that myself or any of our sales guys would ask. And so on the website, if you were to um, select the type of uh, platform you have, or what, what type of car you're racing, um, we have a few two, three, four predetermined shock packages based on budget. Uh, when you select the package that fits your budget, um, and you put those shocks in your shopping cart online, it's going to ask you a series of questions as far as driver weight, chassis type, um, traction racing, et cetera. Uh, again, if we had any additional questions, we would reach out to you. But those are similar questions we would ask uh, if you called in. Um, driver weight, tracks, chassis type, um, what series you're racing potentially, because different series have different rules. Um, so those are all things we would ask. And we would uh, then take that information and go through our book of notes and determine what the best valving package is going to be for you to start. And so since everything is custom, we always communicate with customers. Like if we build this to you, you're going to get the shocks and get a tuning guide that's going to break down how we would adjust the shocks throughout the night for the given track conditions, the amount of grip or how smooth or rough the track is. Um, after a few nights, if you're not feeling exactly what you want, um, maybe you're having a, a certain handling characteristic issue. You can communicate that with us and we'll revalve the shocks free of charge because it is a custom package. And that's what we, we want you to have um, exactly what's going to work for you. And most of the high end shock manufacturers have went to that type of program. It's gotten so specialized over the last uh, three or four years that everybody's demanding a custom package. They're not just buying a pre-built shock off the shelf as they would have 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. All right, let's talk about uh, maintenance um, and different designs. Do they require a different level of maintenance? Not necessarily. The biggest um, biggest difference night to night with the monotube shock is you're going to have to set that gas pressure. So pretty simple process. Um, it's going to take you probably less than a minute to do each shock, so five minutes or less total. Um, but you'll set that pressure to uh, the settings that we recommend or the settings that you found to be uh, preferential to um, your car setup. Uh, where the twin tube, you don't have to fool with the gas pressure. Uh, as far as just overall general maintenance, um, there's really no difference. Both shocks, depending on track conditions, can go 15 to 25 races between rebuilds. Um, we do recommend uh, that you take the shocks off the car every week, clean them in uh, warm, soapy water. Um, give them a good visual inspection. Uh, as Shahab had mentioned, you know, making sure there's no dents in the shock body from rocks or, or anything else. Um, make sure nothing's leaking. And uh, when the shock's off the car and clean, um, compressing it by hand is going to give you a good indication. You'll be able to feel or see the majority of uh, shock issues internally um, just by giving them a good wash and, and stroking them from full extension to full compression um, every week. Uh, but from twin tube to monotube, the main difference, again, is just going to be having to set your gas pressures with the monotube shock. Yeah. And if you're doing that every week, then you have a baseline. You know what it should feel like for sure. So uh, definitely some sound advice there. A question from the chat. Is there a preference or better option between mono and twin tube for heavier cars like pure stocks or street stocks? Um, not necessarily. Um, typically... Uh, those type of classes, um, a lot of them have rules. So you really need to see what your shock rule is for your track. Um, here in Indiana, where we're at, uh, a lot of those series uh, mandate that it is a twin tube shock um, and, and even a steel body twin tube shock to keep costs down. Um, so if you're allowed to run monotube or twin tube, uh, again, it's just really going to come back to driver preference and, and what's making the driver most comfortable. Um, the weight of the vehicle uh, that would have more uh, effect on what your spring rate is going to be uh, versus what style of shock you choose. Difference in length of track where I'm going to or the type of racetrack, you know, if I'm going to a higher bank half mile track or, you know, going to run a, you know, a short quarter mile track that might be a little bit flat. Is there any anything that changes those preferences? Um, not really from monotube to twin tube. Um, the biggest difference there is going to be how smooth or rough the racetrack is um, from 
quarter miles to half miles or flat to bank, that's really going to be a shock setting change uh, more so than um, design change. What are some of, you know, when it comes when we talk about rebuilding shocks and all of this stuff, um, obviously, if people want to come and, and, and order from you and all of that, that's great. But what other services do you offer? You know, if at the end of the season, I want to send mine back in and have everything redone. How does all that work? Yeah, so we have a couple of different uh, programs based on um, your, your budget and how many races you put on your shocks. Um, it can be as simple as, um, hey, I only ran 10 races last year. I just want them checked out and we dyno our customer shocks hundred percent free of charge. We want to make sure uh, what you have is uh, operating at its peak performance. So you're happy and our product looks good on the racetrack. Um, so that would be the bare minimum. Send them in, get them dyno checked. Um, from there, you would have the option to uh, go through just a regular rebuild. And uh, with that, we would completely disassemble the shock. Uh, inspect all of the parts, replace all of the seals, piston bands, uh, shims, oil, and reassemble and match it back to um, the settings when you initially received them. So we'll dyno tune them. You would get new dyno sheets. Um, from there, uh, if you wanted to update, you know, throughout the year, it's kind of a moving target. We're always evolving, um, testing with our, our professional teams. Um, if we have any updates, um, you can ask that question when you send your shock in. So in addition to the rebuild, we would potentially update valving or if there was a, a new piston uh, that we found to be uh, a higher performance throughout the year, you could do that. You could do an update and we would then get your shock back to current spec. Um, if you bought a used race car and, and maybe we hadn't seen the shocks in a while, typically we would recommend updating to the most current spec. And then uh, kind of the last option, if you just want brand new shiny shocks, we do offer a trade-in program. So at the end of the season, just like trading in a vehicle, right? Uh, send us a photo of the shocks. We'll give you a value on them. And, uh, and we would give you just a straight credit towards uh, the price of a new shock. And then we take those trade-in shocks, freshen them up and, uh, and put them in the closeout section of our website for um, teams that uh, maybe couldn't afford a new set. Um, they can get a really nice rebuilt set at a fraction of the price. Wow, that's really neat. What, what what are some lead times on these things? Whether I'm ordering new shocks or getting mine rebuilt, and again, you know, there are people right now who are, uh, you know, definitely thinking about freshening up their race cars, whether it be for some of these big uh, winter type shows and indoor season and all of that. What what are turnaround times? Yes, yeah, so that really varies based on the time of year. Um, we're approaching our slower time, October, November, are our slowest. Uh, times where most of the stuff we're doing is to go to Australia, New Zealand, it's race season over there, um, stuff's winding down here. So turnaround times right now are typically a week or less. As we get closer to Tulsa Shootout and Chili Bowl, um, that can get to the two or three week range. Or uh, again, in the springtime when everybody's getting ready to start racing, lead times can be two or three weeks. Um, but typically we try to keep it two weeks or less. Um, right here in the fall would be our uh, slowest time. So if you had time and you're already disassembling the car and starting to go through the rebuild process, now is a great time to get your stuff serviced um, because you'll, you'll get it back much quicker than if you wait till spring. Is there anything I need to know? Um, and, you know, let's just say I'm running throughout the summer, uh, you know, with one particular setup, you know, with the mono or whatever, as opposed to a twin. And now I'm coming into the off season, but these have just been sitting on the shelf for a while. I mean, is there anything that I need to know, things I need to check, or is this just typical maintenance like what we were talking about? Wash them, you know, run them through their, you know, cycle and all of those things by hand. What do I need to know? Yeah, so one thing that we always tell our customers, especially being here in the Midwest, not really something guys on the West Coast have to worry about, but uh, you know, if your trailer's not inside, uh, typically your race car is going to be inside. But if your trailer stays outside and your spare shocks are mounted in the trailer, um, bring those things inside because it's not good for the seals uh, for them to sit in below freezing temperature. So uh, if your race shop isn't uh, heated or cooled, um, you know, I would definitely recommend wrapping those shocks up, trying to keep them you know, 40, 50 degrees. When it starts to get really cold, the seals get hard. And uh, every spring we get some guys that, hey man, I just pulled my spare shocks out of the trailer and, and we got a couple leakers. And typically that's because the seals just got dried up and really hard sitting out in the, the bad environment. So um, if you can keep the shocks inside, 
in more of a climate controlled condition so uh, so those seals don't get uh, hardened and, and dry up. If I'm rebuilding uh, my own shocks and doing all that, is there any consideration to what type of fluid that I'm using or different weights or anything like that? Yeah, so we um, we sell the shock oil that we use. We use a fully synthetic uh, three weight oil and you definitely would want to stick with the same weight of oil because uh, as you increase or decrease weight, that's going to change the dampening in the shock. Um, change your numbers. So um, I, I definitely recommend if you're running CSI shocks, get the oil from us. Uh, if you're running a different brand of shock, uh, definitely consult with those guys to uh, figure out what they're using um, because you don't want to change um, weight. You, you could change brand. If your shock manufacturer says, hey, we're using uh, Lucas three weight and you want to use Maxima three weight, um, that's probably not going to be that big of a deal, but uh, I wouldn't recommend changing the weight. If they're using full synthetic, use full synthetic um, because uh, some of the twin tube shocks that uh, are, are your lower end, lower cost shocks, they run a very thick oil. And uh, so if you put a thin oil in there, your shock's going to be much softer than it was from factory. And does that change with the valving as well? You know, I mean, is the valving, you know, basically set and spec to what oil is that you're using? Yeah, so uh, the valvings are, are all built around a specific weight of oil. So when we um, go to build you a set of shocks, we have notes for, hey, this is our baseline build for a 140 pound driver in a non-wing sprint car. And, uh, and then we have tolerancing that we, we match for that. So all of those notes are built around the weight oil we use. So if somebody slid a thicker oil in there, um, and we built those shocks and got them on the dyno, they're gonna be stiffer. We're gonna to have to adjust the valve stacks within the shock to get back down to the dampening numbers we want. One of the main reasons we run the lighter oil is uh, it, it doesn't thin out as much with heat. So if you're running a really thick oil and the shocks get hot, um, that oil can thin out much more than a thin oil can. And so you're gonna have what we would call force fade and the shock gets softer throughout a run. Um, it's a big issue on the fendered cars for sure, uh, because they're not getting as much air moving across the shock body to keep them cool. But even on an open wheel sprint car application, the rear shocks can get really hot because the exhaust is blowing straight back on them. Um, so we always recommend for our customers, if they can to use a, uh, some type of exhaust turn down to keep the exhaust from uh, coming straight back to them. We'll get shocks in for service and this beautiful black body has turned to purple or gold. It's gotten so hot that it's discolored the anodizing on the body. And uh, that's not from the shock heating up, that's from the exhaust uh, shooting straight on the shock. Wow, uh, what is, what's that doing to the performance when it gets that hot? Well, that's, it depends on how hot it gets, but with a twin tube shock, we've seen, uh, you know, again, out on the coast, they have to run really large mufflers on their race cars. Um, because of noise restrictions. So they have the length of the exhaust and then they put you know, a muffler uh, that's another 18, 24 inches. Well, that gets the exhaust um, gas even closer to the shock. And um, so we've seen some shocks get so hot that it actually melted the gas bag. Um, and then we had a complete you know, shock failure. Um, it can get so hot it melts the seals out of the shock. Um, if it doesn't get that hot and it's just getting it hot, um, you know, you're going to have some fade. If you dynoed your shock before you uh, went out for the feature and then the shock got to say seven, 800 degrees because exhaust was blowing straight on it and you come in um, and want to take that shock off the car, number one, it'd burn your hand if you didn't have a glove on it. But if you were able to get it off and get it on the dyno and dyno it, um, you're going to see a substantially softer uh, compression and rebound damping just because it's gotten so hot. Um, so it thins the oil out, and as the oil gets thinner, it passes through everything easier, and there's not as much uh, dampening resistance within the shock. Wow. All right, uh, another question from the chat. And again, if you have a question, just feel free to type it into the chat, and uh, we'll definitely talk about it here. Uh, you talked about driver comfort, but in terms of pure performance in perfect conditions and an asphalt short track, what would your recommendation between mono and twin be? Uh, I, I would recommend monotube for most any application where it's allowed per the rules and uh, it fits on the car. You're able to get your um, compression stroke um, 
have enough compression stroke and a monotube shock fits adequately on the car, I would recommend that in most any application just because uh, I feel like it's a more high performance shock. Um, it, it's not going to fade as much throughout the run. It's more tunable. Uh, where again, as Shahab had mentioned, we're flowing more fluid through that shock. We have more options as far as dampening curves because of the amount of fluid we're flowing through the piston. Um, so I would always recommend a, a monotube shock if, uh, if it fits and it's allowed by your rules. Yeah, you know, when it comes to the rules, I mean, a lot of times those are ever evolving. You had mentioned, um, you know, not being able to have, you know, certain things on the shocks and all of that. But um, as far as just trying to advance the rules and to say, hey, this is where this is evolving and getting those things going. Are you seeing any changes in different series or things opening up maybe where people might want them to in that regard? You know, it kind of goes back and forth. Um, you know, USAC, for example, two years ago, outlawed uh, cockpit adjustable shocks. So you could run an adjustable shock, but they said, hey, you can no longer run cockpit adjusters. So that would save a team $350 if they had the actual adjusters into the cockpit uh, on the car. And uh, they did it with good intention to save the racer money. However, the majority of the racers already had the cockpit adjusters. So they took them out of the car, set them on the shelf. And uh, throughout the season, they had so many complaints from the racers that, you know, it became a safety concern, right? We're starting with a full load of fuel and the car needs to feel one way. And then when the fuel burns off, it needs to be another. And racers are crazy, right? They're going to run their cars as tight as possible for the end of the race. Um, previously, they could uh, make some adjustments with the shock to make the car more drivable early in the race to have that ultimate performance at the end. Once they took the cables out, um, they just were, the cars were almost undrivable at the beginning and uh, they said it was a safety concern. So USAC went back and allowed the cockpit adjusters the next year. Um, I certainly think there's room on a lot of the dirt modified uh, side to, uh, to revisit the rule. They, their rules um, state that you have to run a steel body shock. And again, with good intention, when those rules were written, most people were going to the local auto parts store, buying a steel shock that you would use on your passenger car, bolting it on their race car. And so they say, hey, this is what you got to run. It's more expensive for us to manufacture a steel body shock than it is an aluminum shock. Um, you have a slight reduction in material cost, but it's much more expensive to machine steel than aluminum. It's a harder material to machine. It goes through tooling. Uh, much more having metal uh, steel chips in your CNCs is, is not nice compared to aluminum. So our steel body shock is more expensive than our aluminum, but they have to do it per the rules. So some of these sanctioning bodies can really start to, to look at that, um, maybe put a price cap on rather than just a material. Um, but the rules do change frequently. Um, it's just something as a manufacturer we have to stay on top of to make sure that one, we're never sending a shock out that's illegal uh, for a particular application. And two, making sure the customers have um, the best performing shock within the rules that they're, they're racing. Now, you had mentioned something earlier, too. Um, you know, sprint car drivers, some people might run winged and non-winged events. So, uh, you know, if, if driver weight is obviously such a big consideration, how much is the consideration, uh, what type of wing you're running? And, and whether it be on a sprint car, or maybe you're running late model or modified shows that allow or require different size spoilers and things like that. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, on the sprint car side first, uh, wing versus non-wing, um, totally different shock package. So uh, 10 years ago, you would have guys that would run the same shocks, um, but as things have gotten more specialized, even on the chassis side, the chassis are different now. Um, uh, the way the motor sits in the car, the height of the motor, there's non-wing chassis and wing chassis. So it's totally different. The length of the shocks are different. Um, you know, on wing sprint cars, we're very cognizant of shock body length on the left rear to make sure that we can get adequate bump rubber gap. Most all those guys are running a bump rubber, at least on the left rear and, and oftentimes on other corners of the car. So shock length is very important on the wing side. So even the length of the shocks different from wing to non-wing sprint cars anymore. Um, on the modified late model side, uh, like UMP and then USMTS, they have different rules packages, um, some with a spoiler, some without, and that definitely changes uh, how we need to build the shock 
from a compression and rebound standpoint, what adjustments we need to be able to give the guys so they can make adequate grip. Because obviously when you take the spoiler off, you don't have as much rear grip. Um, it kind of pushes that grip more towards the nose of the race car. Yeah, if, you know, if I, if I tell you, hey, look, this is what I'm running throughout most of the summer, but I'm going to run just a couple of winter shows and it's going to have a big spoiler or something on it. Is that something that I can get by or is that something that, you know, hey, if I'm really serious about this, I, I need to really consider getting another pair for some of the off-season shows or some of my non-local track shows? Yeah, it really just depends on how serious you are. Certainly, you can make it work and the car is going to go around the racetrack and it's probably going to handle... 70 or 80 percent of of peak um, but if you're going there to win those races um, and you don't want to leave you know any stone unturned so to speak i would definitely recommend either having your shocks revalved or having an additional set uh, for those different rule changes you talked about earlier uh accessories like cockpit adjusters and different things like that and i know on your website there's a lot of different things that you offer and and i know here today we're really talking about twin tube and monotube shocks and all of that but again you know a lot of different rules packages a lot of different options a lot of different types of race cars so what are the things that uh some of the other things that you guys offer i talk about some of our accessory shop that we offer you've designed most of them <laughs> um is we have like a quarter midget accessories. We've got a, uh, a spring spacer, uh, so you can run like the shorter eye box spring, shorter free length spring. Uh, got a ride height tool to help making ride height adjustments easier. Uh, let's see. A lot of bump rubber accessories. Uh, again, that's become more and more important. We have bump rubbers, we have bump springs, different kits that we've assembled to try to make that uh, more of a User friendly, where they can just buy a kit and everything they need is in the kit. They're not having to buy a bunch of different accessories. Um, we do sell torsion bars and springs um, based on what type of car you have, because that's going to work hand in hand with the shock. So we we have uh, different grades of torsion bars. We sell those uh, dynoed. Um, so you get a dyno sheet with the torsion bar. We do carry. Uh, Ibach and Hypercoil uh, and Landrum springs. So we have a variety of different springs based on your application. Uh, shock covers are a big mover for us. Uh, if you're running that monotube shock, <clears throat> as Shahab mentioned, a rock ding will really um, hamper the performance of the shock or potentially lead to a failure. So we have uh, polycarbonate and carbon fiber shock covers to help protect your investment with the shocks. Um, different styles of shock adjuster cables are available. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much everything you need suspension wise, we try to, uh, to provide for you. Um, so you can get it all in one spot. Wow, that really is full service. You know, a lot of what keeps coming up here is you talk about different series, different types of race cars, different rules packages, things that you guys have to keep up with as well. How much time do you all spend at the track? How much time do you spend racing? Uh, a lot. Uh, as soon as we get done here, I'm headed up to, uh, to do a test. Um, to test some new uh, shock components. So we'll be at a track this afternoon. Um, next weekend, going out to California to test with some customers to get ready for the Tulsa shootout. Going to Charlotte the following week. Um, so uh, I attend about 80 races a year um, across many platforms from quarter midgets to uh, sprint cars and everything in between. Uh, we, we get Shahab out to, to some races as well. We have a we have a factory support trailer that we take to a lot of events. So basically it's a mobile workstation. We have a shock dyno in there, all the same tools and equipment that we have here at the shop. Uh, we take that to 30 to 40 events a year to um, be able to service, uh, repair and tune customer stuff right there track side. A lot of the shock manufacturers have uh, rigs like that to be able to better service their customers. And those really come in handy at, your week-long events, your Knoxville Nationals, uh, Chili Bowl, stuff like that, where you're there for a whole week. Um, you can keep guys stuff fresh and fixed up. And if track conditions change, tune, tune for that stuff. Wow, that's great service. What are some things that people leave on the table? You know, when you're talking to racers, maybe things that they're not doing or things that they're doing wrong, um, you know, advice you give some of your customers on what they can do to better their performance? Yeah, the biggest thing I always try to preach to folks is just doing the basics 100%. So um, I'm not of the belief as a, a shock tuner or a crew chief, uh, even when I raced in my younger days, 
that uh, you need to reinvent the wheel. Um, so many of the things we do now, they were done that way in the 60s, 70s. Um, new fads come in and fall out over time. Certainly things have improved, manufacturing's improved, products have improved, but um, if you do the basics right, so your race car is square, um, all of your bearings and ball joints are all serviced and, and smooth, um, your baseline setup is a, is a good baseline setup, your engine is uh, serviced and operating properly, your torsion bars or springs aren't wore out, your shocks are serviced. If you do all of those things, just make sure everything's maintained, serviced, and your race car is square and there's no failing parts on it, um, I firmly believe you're going to beat 70 to 75 percent of your competitors when you go to the track. So the races are one in the shop. I know it's kind of a cliche, but um, when a guy unloads at the racetrack and he's in full thrash mode working on stuff, that's probably not going to guy that's going to be parked on the front straightaway at the end of the night. Yeah, and that's something that you see week in and week out, night after night as well. That makes a huge difference. Uh, another question from the chat. What guidelines would you suggest uh, Would you suggest as to correct nitrogen pressures? Asphalt, super late model, uh, Penske 7500, single rebound adjustable on bump stops. What results would I expect with increased pressures currently at 50 PSI? A little bit of a hard question to answer, not knowing uh, the dampening curve of that shock, uh, whether it has a base valve or not. I know the Penske 7500 has provisions for a base valve, um, very nice shock absorber. Um, so a little bit hard to answer, but the one thing I can answer as you increase gas pressure, you're in increasing internal spring rate in the shock. So that shock's gonna feel like it has a little bit more compression and a little bit less rebound. Uh, I mentioned he's running on bump stops. So one thing you have to be careful with that is you're going to run a certain amount of rebound in that shock to keep your bump stops loaded. Um, as you increase gas pressure, uh, the need to increase rebound to still load those bump stops adequately um, can change slightly. So you need to be very careful with that. Uh, 50 PSI might be the minimum you can run in that shock if there isn't a base valve. Um, I don't know uh, without actually seeing the shock and the dampening curve, but uh, certainly increasing gas pressure could lead to a need to increase rebound uh, to still sit on your bump stops the same way you're accustomed to. Yeah, you know, when it comes to like speeding up and slowing down rebound, increasing, decreasing, um, what are some guidelines there? What do you recommend? You know, I, I keep saying it goes back to driver feel, but that really is the case. Rebound, um, a shock as a whole is basically a timing device. It's timing the pitch control of the car, how it moves front to back, side to side. So as you increase rebound, um, it's going to slow down that transfer. So if you increase rebound on the front, it's not going to transfer weight to the back as quickly. Um, as you decrease, it's going to transfer back quicker. So really, it depends on what you're needing to do. Um, in a dirt track application, if you're needing more forward drive, you're, you're spinning your tires on, on exit, um, oftentimes a decrease in rebound will help that because it's going to transfer weight back to those rear tires a little bit quicker. Um, so it really just depends on the application and what the driver is feeling, what you're seeing from the race car. A lot of it can be identified with tire temperatures. Um, so you don't just have to rely on the driver's feel. Sometimes the driver gets a false feel. Um, we'll, we'll see that a lot. Um, that the driver is going to tell you the last thing that he does on corner exit with the steering wheel. So if he's saying that he is loose, um, you know, he's got the wheel cocked to the right on exit, that could have been initiated on corner entry because the car was too tight. So the car's tight on entry, he's steering it to the left, and eventually he gets so much wheel into it that it snaps loose. Well, the driver oftentimes is going to tell you, yeah, man, I'm loose because he's on the exit of the corner, he had the wheels to the right. Tire temperatures will tell you a little bit more of the story. And uh, again, if you I always tell people, if you can fix your corner entry, most of the time it's going to fix your middle to exit. Yeah, there are times where maybe people are trying to fix a problem by going stiffer or lighter, you know, on a spring or on pressures when really the problem they're having is with rebound instead, they need to consider that. Yeah, that certainly can be the case. Um, shocks are definitely a fine tuning device. If you're just getting too much travel on a particular corner um, or a car's rolling over too much, 
most of the time that's going to be a need to increase uh, spring rate uh, either in your coilover spring torsion bar release spring depending on what the suspension is um, but uh, because again, a shock is a fine tuning device. So if the thing's traveling four inches and you need it to travel two, uh, a dampening change in the shock really isn't gonna fix that. You're gonna need to do it with spring rate. Well, gentlemen, uh, I, I know people can find you uh, through your page on EPAR Trade, um, and it, it just sounds like such a comprehensive service that you guys offer, and uh, really a, a great educational hour here uh, doing this webinar. It's been fascinating. Congratulations on moving into the new shop. Looking forward to seeing you guys at a racetrack here in the near future. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, and uh, we appreciate being on here. EPAR Trade's a great platform, and, uh, and we love being a part of the family. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the webinar has been recorded. It will be posted later on on the ePortrait platform as well as on our YouTube channel. We also pushed a CSI's product back on the homepage of ePortrait. So if you go on ePortrait.com right now, you can see uh, you know, Garrett's product right there and connect with them directly. We will be back next week. Next week, we'll be traveling to Europe. We'll be talking to our good friends uh, at the Motorsport Industry Association to explore uh, technology for Motorsport Valley. And the following week, we'll stay in Europe and we'll talk uh, uh, to Immersive about the high performance battery for a motorsport application. So again, thank you very much for being with us today. Let's go racing and we'll uh, see you next week. Registering on EPAR Trade is easy. Fill out your name, email, phone number, and create a secure password. Next, select your business type. Choose supplier if you're looking to display products or services and connect with buyers. Choose racing business if you're looking to find new parts and connect with suppliers. Choose race team if you own or are a member of a professional racing team. Begin typing your company name. We most likely already have your company in our database, which you can select from the drop-down. Then, enter your job title. Choose Claim Company if you'll be editing your company profile. Other members of your company can choose Join Company if they'd like to use ePartrade as well. You can view and agree to our terms of use here. If you'd like to receive our weekly newsletter, choose Accept. Click Register Now, and your registration will be submitted for approval. You'll need to confirm your email once it goes through. To keep our platform industry only, you'll be approved shortly after. If we require additional proof of business, we'll reach out. Welcome to ePartrade.